Welcome to Mobile Agent TV. I am Michael Thorne of Remax Little Oak Realty in Langley, BC. And my co-host Dave Fuckware is, I don't know where he is. So we've jumped on air without him. So if he pops into the, into the show, that's where we are. Now, he won't know that we're live when he pops in. So um, he's a good guy. He'll be fine about that. Uh, you can interact with us live on the show by using the hashtag MATV live, as well as you can get us on Twitter at Mobile Agent TV. And we are live on Facebook right now. Or, uh, sorry, live on YouTube right now, Facebook next week, uh, live on YouTube right now. So uh, you can uh, ask questions in the comment section of YouTube of today's guest. This is going to be uh, this is one of the most anticipated topics that, that, that I've seen on the schedule uh, for the show in, in, in a very long time. There's going to be a ton of value brought to all of you guys, so uh, definitely ask your questions. Uh, but before we go to today's guest, a couple uh, annou announcements I want to make. I want to send out two happy birthdays to two amazing past guests. I want to say happy birthday to Kevin Tangon, uh, who's been a past guest, who was a, a big contributor inside Remax Play, who's an all-around great guy. Uh, happy birthday to you. And then a happy birthday goes out to the one and only Bruce Johnson. Happy birthday, sir. Uh, two of the best guys inside uh, uh, the Remax world. Uh, I think Bruce right now is playing hockey for Remax in Italy today. Uh, and then he's on his way back home. They just finished up their European uh, Remax hockey tour. And he's on his way back. Uh, uh, Next week, we're going to come to you live from the Genuine Hustle Conference in Tacoma. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic uh, a conference out there, which is just south of Seattle. Um, uh, we're going to be tackling the, – the big topic of the conference is going to be community, which I'm so passionate about, which brings a ton of value. So we're going to be coming live Wednesday afternoon, evening, still ironing out those times. Uh, but there's going to be a good group of people out there that we'll get on camera and have a round table, a real estate round table with them. And then uh, one of the most anticipated shows that we've, uh, we've announced is, is being moved. Our show November 18th, which is all about live streaming on Facebook and YouTube with the live streaming pros. These guys are unbelievable experts. Is moved to December 2nd from November 18th. And the reasoning for that is the old computer that I'm rolling on right now won't show all the bells and whistles that we can do on Facebook Live and YouTube Live through OBS. So my new MacBook Pro that I ordered last week is supposed to show up on November the 18th, November the 24th. So I'll make sure that I've got the new MacBook Pro ready to go there. That's going to be a fantastic episode. Don't miss that. Move from November 18th to December 2nd, live streaming and the, and, and the importance of doing that which is a huge topic right now uh, and a huge opportunity within our industry. Uh, so today's guest, we're going to be talking about the psychology of listing. We've already had a bit of banter back and forth the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've had a little chat 10 minutes before getting on air. You're not going to want to miss this episode. Tons and tons of value with our, uh, with our guest, Linda Okanaski. I probably got that wrong, even though I practiced before I went on air. And as always, we read out our guest one tweet. So I just want to pop in. Bomb Bomb's amazing. I know that Dave Fockware just opened up his email because I just got a link saying that my email is being open and that the link's being clicked. So I predict in the next 15, 20 seconds, Dave Fockware pops into the show. That's, that's how amazing Bomb Bomb is. Uh, so we always read our guest 160 Twitter bio. You can get her on twi Twitter at Linda o OKO. So Linda OKO. And uh, 160 Twitter bio reads, Proud Mama, CEO of Remax Leading Edge. Damn it, the consumer doesn't know what is going on behind the curtain. Welcome to the show, Linda. Glad to be here, Michael. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a very fun episode. Now, uh, Dave's going to pop in here in a couple of seconds. But just, just so, see, see, how did I know that? Bomb Bomb is such an amazing tool. I knew Dave was coming. Because I know he opened up his email. This is, this is once again, Bomb Bomb has a ton of value. I predicted this, Dave. Dave, welcome to the show. We've just oh. interviewed, uh, introduced Linda. But, but just so you know, we, we started the show by saying happy birthdays to Kevin Tangon and Bruce Johnson, two amazing uh, I guys. did the same thing this morning. I sent them off a little thing there. There you go. Linda, give our viewers uh, – Linda has been named to one of the 100 most influential leaders in real estate by in Inman News. A lot of people are very well of who Linda is within the real estate industry throughout North America and around the world. I, I first heard Linda speak in Berlin, Germany, so we will say around the world. And um, – and you're well known within the Remax, uh, Remax family. Linda, just a brief history in real estate for our viewers. 
I'm an accidental real estate persona. Um, I think I got into the business just to help people out and discovered it was uh, an amazing opportunity. And I think uh, people shouldn't come in for the money. If they come in to do great work for people, the money follows. Now, what did you, what did you mean in your Twitter bio uh, uh, when you state, damn it, the consumer doesn't know what's going on behind the curtain? You put that out publicly in your bio. What's, what's, the, what's the thought and the meaning behind making a statement like that? I'm writing a book called The Dirty Secrets of Real Estate. You and I both know, and so does Dave, that there are amazing, great agents working every day doing terrific things for the consumer, using great strategies, doing the right thing. I don't know how it is in Langley, but I can tell you everywhere I've been, there are stories of misbehaving agents lining their own pockets, being very self-serving. Uh, sometimes they don't, agents don't get into properties the way they should. Their buyers aren't in. Sometimes we're not sure our offers are always being presented. Sometimes I think agents try to sell things themselves, pocket listings. Our industry has a reputation for a reason, and I believe that we need to talk about it, expose it, and elevate it. Now, now your purpose of putting that in your Twitter bio as, as a Remaxer, is that more of a, a, a conversation that you would like to see within the industry? Is that statement there to say, hey, agents, let's have this conversation? Or was that statement to say, hey, public, let's have the conversation? Um, it starts both places. The consumer is... Um, not as savvy as they should be. You've seen it. You and Dave both know that there are agents out there who aren't really always serving their client well. Um, it's a minority, but it happens in every market. I mean, look at New York City. The Realtor Association doesn't even uh, give realtor designations in New York City because they're so busy not cooperating. Yeah. You know, that goes on everywhere. So this is an amazing topic for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, your, your, your passion and your knowledge that you speak on this topic is, 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 will, will make this show amazing. But to me, there are some cornerstones in this industry that are timeless. There are just certain things in this industry that are timeless. Being a great listing agent is a cornerstone to a great business in good markets and in bad markets and in balanced markets. I think one of the real good keys is to, is to become a great listing agent. And we're going to get into the psychology of listing. We're going to talk about crazy people. We're going to talk about therapy. We're going to talk about naked skiers. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff. But Linda, on this topic that you speak so much passion about, and, and you know the journey that, that, that's before our audience here for the next 50 minutes or so, where do we start? Where do you want to start with, with the psychology of listing? I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, listing property is the backbone of our industry. When you're a strong listing agent, you are building your brand, you have the buyers coming to you, and it is part of the business that I think is much more nuanced and takes a lot more skill. So I think we all need to up our game in listing. And you're right. I mean, when, when, when you think about a great listing agent, um, you, you think about the, the leads and the business that come from being, of having that listing. When you're a buyer's agent, those buyers don't generate business for you. I mean, repeat referral, obviously, but that happens on both ends. But the phone isn't ringing off the hook because you're working with a buyer. And so there's a lot of opportunities that come that way. And, and it's about building a business. So no doubt. So let's... Uh, Start with, where, where do you want to start? With, with therapy, with crazy people, with, List, with all of it? Listing is more complicated. It's just more complicated. It requires a lot more skills, marketing skills, super negotiation skills with the client and the public. It takes um, really savvy strategies and tactics. Working with a buyer is, you know, most agents when they get in the business, they start with buyers because it is less complicated. Find them a house and get them through the transaction. But there's a lot of um, things you've got to really be thinking about if you want to be a great listing agent. But here's the problem we all have. Ever had an experience where their client didn't take their advice? Ever happened to you or David? <laughs> it does. It does definitely happen, Dave. And we've talked about this. It's a big problem for us because when, when, when a seller 
we're, we're doing a listening presentation and somebody kind of wants to butt head, butts head with me. I had to turn around to Vanessa. I got to keep my mouth shut because we lose listings because I just go right back at them. I said, you know, it's some of it's, some of it's insane. The, the things people say, some of it's like nuts. Yeah. Well, there you go. You're using my words. Insane. Nuts. People, you know, they watch uh, HGTV and they think they know real estate, right? Or they have an aunt in Erie, Pennsylvania that has a story that they're going to guide them through their entire transaction. Um, and people are spending a lot of money for their listing agent and we better damn be worthy of it. So it starts with, we all see crazy things in the business. Um, people who won't price right, people who don't want to pay you, people who won't clean up, people who won't pay, people who won't get their house ready for market. You get people who won't, you know, uh, of letting people in they they sabotage themselves all the time is that true yeah okay so i want to talk about listing as therapy and i want to think about what a therapist does to be successful so you know picture the therapist and the patient on the couch what is the therapist doing michael what's going on asking, in that? asking a ton of questions why because I just want to ask you and David, do you like to be told what to do? No. No. <laughs> no. And neither do your sellers. They don't want to be told what to do. And we walk in there, guns blazing, knowing what to do. And I'm going to suggest that if you want to really be successful when you're listing property, it starts with the very first phone call and you got to start asking questions because if you ask the right questions, you'll get them to arrive at the right answers. And you can really start to um, navigate the transaction and set up the expectations, not by telling them anything, but having them arrive at those uh, more reasonable conclusions. Now, does this work for everybody? No, but I'm pretty damn sure you can eliminate the headaches. I was listing 90 houses a year when I was listing. And I didn't have time for any of the crap. Do you have that ski photo? Could I you do. Put that let, up, me, Michael? Uh, let me let me get this for you. You can keep talking, and I will get this. I will get so this let up me for set you. This up here. So I've asked Michael to put up my favorite real estate photo, and it is a picture of a guy in Vail, Colorado, who is hanging upside down with his pants around his ankles from the chairlift. And how many things have to go wrong to have that happen? Can you imagine? Is that the craziest photo? <laughs> so, so with that, my thing is when I saw this photo, I thought, my God, that is just what happens to my real estate agents. They are always hanging upside down with their pants around their ankles, hanging from the chairlift because, you know, these things can be avoided. There's no reason to be in that position. And the things I want to talk about today are concrete things to set yourself up so that you're not... You know, how much wasted time is spent the week before closing when there's title issues, when there's, you know, things start to go off the rails with clients. And I do believe if you kind of have a system in place, ask the right questions and have some procedures with follow up in writing on every point, you can change the entire transaction. And that's what I really focused on. And I was very selfishly at first, Michael. I was trying to create these systems to make transactions smoother because I couldn't stand the crap anymore. I didn't have time for all this, you know, nonsense that was happening in the transaction. And what I realized was when I started to do that, the benefits to the client were huge. Yeah. They weren't suffering from all the crap either. So let's talk about going to battle with questions. All right. So think of yourself. Um, therapy now, and I'm going to go back to medicine, when people are trying to lose weight with doctors now, when they have addiction problems, alcoholism, when they're trying to change behavior, um, the new thing in medicine is called motivational therapy, you know, motivational questioning. And that's what they're doing. So if that's what doctors are doing, certainly we're not certified MDs in any way, but there isn't one of us that hasn't referred to ourselves as, I feel like a therapist. I feel like a, you know, a, I'm the I'm in family counseling here, right? That's what we all feel like. So if we took that motivational interviewing technique one step into our business, I think we can come up with different results. So it starts on the first phone call. You know, you go to battle with questions. 
And here's, and, and I have to say, that first phone call is, it shouldn't be, hi, um, my name is, you know, uh, you know, someone calls you, Michael, and they want to see you at 4 o'clock on Tuesday. Here's my address, and you ask them a few things about the house. This is your chance to get the inside scoop on the house and start to engage the seller with what's important in the process. So that first question you want to ask, and I have 26 of my own, but let me tell you, I stole the first one from Lee Brown. Absolutely one of my favorite real estate questions. She might have shared it with you, but this is ingenious and also a good cocktail party question. You're on the phone, you haven't met the seller yet, and you want to start to set the stage with the seller on, you know, expectations. So Lee Brown has come up with this amazing question, which is, Dave, I'm, I'm on the phone with you, and uh, you just called me for an opinion of value or a CMA, and which, by the way, let's stop doing them. Never, ever. I want everyone in the audience today, Dave, I want you, Michael, I never, ever again doing an opinion of value. I'm never doing a CMA. What happens when people call you? They call you and say, Dave, will you come over and give me a what on your on the house? Give me a price right yeah. give me a price. my house yeah yeah it's on my house come over and give me a price and as agents we really make the mistake of sure let me come over and give you a price in your house and then what happens they're calling three other agents or five agents and they all want a price from them we've agreed to go over and give them a price on their house and now we're competing on price yeah. and mistake right because if Dave tells them that their house is worth $40,000 more than um, Michael does, then the homeowner thinks, Dave appreciates my house more. Dave likes my house more. Dave understands my house more. And by the way, I like Dave more because he gets me in my house. I'm hiring Dave. And Michael might have had the right price. You know, Dave might be, you know, buying the listing or really not that good at pricing or gets caught up um, you know, wanting to please. I think that's what happens to agents. We want to please that seller and they want to hear a good number and that's how we get the listing. So we have to change the conversation on the phone. I'll come back to Lee's question in a minute. But on the phone, when someone says, Michael, I want you to come over and give me a price, you need to say, that's not why you called me. Now, this generally confuses the client because that's exactly why they called you. You're going, I have nothing to do with the price. The market determines the price. You called me because you're looking for a strategy for a successful transaction. Certainly you want to get the most money, but you're calling me for tactics. You want to know how to maximize your sale. That's why you called me. Price is going to take care of itself. Matter of fact, I'm going to let you pick the price, Michael. I'm going to show you depending on how long you want to be on the market and what kind of risks you want to take, how we can determine the price because the price determines how fast you're going to sell and what your success rate will be. You, I'm going to give you that background information, but that's not why you called. You need someone to get this house sold for top dollar and do it as smooth as possible. So that's the change in the conversation. Do never, ever agree to go over and give someone a price. That's a secondary thing. It's coincidence. You've got to change the language on the phone. You're not doing an opinion of value. You're not going over a market analysis. You're going over there and the magic word is, does that make sense? It does. And, and, and I think the equivalent of it in our industry is when a mortgage broker picks up the phone and the first question is, what's your lowest rate? I, I think it's very, it's a very equivalent thing. Like, there's no value there. It's just, it's just shopping. And, and it, that I, I totally agree. It, it, it changes everything without a doubt. Yeah. So now you're on the phone and you've changed the conversation around and let's do a get to know your opening one question. And this is where I love Lee Brown's question. You know, Michael, David, on a scale of one to 10, um, how would you rate your house, right? So that is the one is this baby is a tear down. It's bringing the bulldozers, you know, it's really a piece of land. And 10 meaning, and this is really important that you get this right. 10 meaning it is in a highly desirable A plus location. That this house is beautifully sited on the curb. That when you pull up the landscaping is ideal. It's freshly painted. Everything about the garage, the gardens, the, whatever it is, the outside is. When you walk in, it is freshly painted in today's hip 
neutral colors. I've added a little bit to Lee's question. Um, you know, the kitchen and baths are state of the art. It looks like it was staged for a Hollywood movie set. And, uh, and everything about it is perfectly appointed. How do you rate your house? Now, how high have we set the bar? And the magic of the question isn't in how they really answer. And by the way, the most common answer is seven. Over and over again, you get six, sevens, and eights, but seven's right there. Because everyone's house, just like their children, is you know better than average, right? <laughs> it's the way it goes. So with that being said, you know, the follow-up question is, what would it take to make it a 10? Now, you've engaged the seller to tell you everything that's wrong with the house. I, it's, it, it's funny, Linda, I, and, and, and I'll link up Lee Brown's episode right there. Uh, <laughs> but that question changed my business, and I've said it on the show many, many times. That, that question just resonated with me so much, in, 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 and I'd been practicing real estate for 24, 23 years before I heard that question, it changes everything. It is one of those, and this is where we are, because I'm not a script guy, but I don't like the word script. I like systems, but that's a script that, that, that just has changed my business in the last year because now they're going to tell you the carpets aren't perfect. You know, we need to do this. We need to do that. The shed needs a new roof on it. They're telling you all the things without you insulting their home that they love so dearly, and they know the shortcomings of it. It is a magical question, and, and you're going to and you're going to bring some magical things too as well. These are these little skills that that will change you from 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 sort of stumbling through a listing appointment to crushing it. And um, right. it's and, and 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 the fact that you see that as a game changing question, and I see it, and your responses to when you ask the questions are the same that I get. There is something that's magical about that question. See, okay, and let me take it one step further. I'm sorry, Dave. Oh, well, go ahead. That oh, go ahead. Is, is a great cocktail party question. You're out with friends, you're out with family, you're just socializing. You can pop that question in a crowd and get people talking about real estate in their houses and in a way that isn't that schlocky. I have a new listing, awful stuff. So I just think it's a way to Absolutely. serve it up. Yeah, the, the, well, the number one thing that when, when I, I do a listing presentation seminar around the region and stuff, and I've been doing this for a long time, and the number one thing that I always tell everybody is you need to differentiate yourself. And one of the ways to do it is what you just said, because most agents are not going to do what the approach that you just proposed there, and, and it makes perfect sense. And you're already, you're different than everybody else. Um, and if you can't differentiate yourself from the commodities that real estate agents are, you know, then you're going to get four out of five or well, I'll say four out of 10 listings and you're going to struggle and you, you'll get it done, but it, you're, you're just not going to be a success unless you do that. And, and, and that's and a perfect I, way to start right out the gate. Yeah, I mean, met them and already you're different than everybody. Else. Yeah. And, 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 and let me take that and let me ask you a question about that, Linda. <clears throat> do you think by going as a therapist, by asking questions that the results that a therapist wants are the same? Do you think asking questions creates that trust that is so imperative in building a business. Do you think it is in the questions that trust gets handed over much like a therapist would? I think it's two prong on that. It's the questions and it's listening. Real estate agents talk way too much. We are, uh, for the most part, very extroverted group. We come in knowing what to do and people like you better. And um, Jay Hummer, used to work for the region here in New England, shared a story once that just stuck with me. You go to a party and you get cornered by some guy who starts whipping out his vacation photos. He starts telling you about his health. You know his medications. He's talking about his kids. You'll get a word in edgewise. And when he goes home, he says, oh my God, I love that Michael Thorne. You know, all he did is talk to you all night long, but he expressed himself. You listened to him and you went home thinking, Oh my God, you know, that guy, I, you know, he, he ruined my whole night. All I did is he talked about himself and agents talk about themselves way too much. So the thing is asking questions and getting them to talk. Um, we have to zip it up and shut up and allow the process to work. That's where you build the bond. Isn't that what a therapist does anyway? They ask questions and you get, you, you provide you as the person doing the listening or rather, uh, 
the therapist asks the questions and the patient comes up with the answers. Right, exactly. So let's talk about some of the questions you need to ask on the phone. Now, my first phone call isn't a five or 10 minute thing. It's half an hour to 45 minutes. And let me tell you now, if you told the seller you were gonna be on the phone for 45 minutes, they're just looking for a price, remember? So, you know, just start asking the questions. If they need to go, they'll let you know. But they are so engaged that you are treating them differently, that you're asking things that no, the other agents that they called didn't ask. I do not find this to be problematic. So let's start asking some of the basic questions. And they're quick. And I, didn't, I don't have them written down, but give you some ideas. And you can all enhance these. But, you know, how is it that you came to call me? Right? Is there a referral that you need to know about? Um, have you been following the market? What do they know? Take copious notes about which house, because you know they, they know about this house, but they don't know what it really sold for, or they heard what it sold for. Find out so that you can go back when you do that. Um, come back with your pricing strategy. You'll know exactly what um, they're referring to. So you're going to have to start to ask them things like, does anyone in your house smoke? Because isn't it the worst thing when you do, you walk into a house and you go, oh my God, I, you know, this house reeks. But if you ask that question on the phone, it's just become part of your standard procedure. It's not unusual for them to say, you know, why do you ask? Well, geez, if you're someone, if I can tell someone in your house smokes, that could be tens of thousands or even $100,000 off the price of your house. That's why. Then you follow up with the next logical question on smells. Um, do you have any pets? Well, if I can tell you a pet when you walk in, same thing. You know, there's nothing like saying I have seven cats. You all can smell that house right now. But now when you go over to the house, you've already broached that. And let me tell you, if they have cats or they smoke, when you walk in the door, they're not offering you coffee. They're not asking you to take your coat. They're going, can you smell anything? And that is the genius part of the question because you're not having to deliver that news later. You've already established it's a criteria. And by the way, don't, don't opine to the walk through the house because I've made that mistake in the past where you're in the front door going, no, it smells good. And then it stinks when you get up around the corner <laughs> or in the basement or something. There. Um, you're going to ask a whole bunch of questions. I, you know, it gets, you can get super detailed. Um, tell me, um, you know, do you have um, any second mortgages? You know, do you have any home equity lines? Start to ask questions that no one else is asking. How much do you own your house? Not as big a deal now that we're not doing the short sales we were doing, but very valuable before. But it's good to know. Um, tell me, have you refinanced within the last three years? People always scratch their head. I don't know about Canada, but here local banks will have a prepaid um, clause, a mortgage penalty. And, you know, it's very rare that one comes up. But people say, why are you asking about refinancing? I said, I need to protect you. I need to make sure that we don't sell this house within the three years and you don't have a mortgage penalty. What have you just protect, uh, projected? You're protecting them. No one else even thought to ask that question. You can totally distinguish your house, yourself, top to bottom, when you start to ask all the questions you need to know before you get there. And, so, and, and, and Linda, is, 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 is a side note of asking all those questions Holy crap, I just wanted a price. I didn't want to answer all these questions. Thank you very much for your time. Isn't that, isn't that, it, then at least you're qualifying them opposed to doing the CMA, you know, putting apart an appointment and going. Like, if, if, if you find a stumbling block in these questions, isn't this sort of like a self filtering, I don't want to waste my time? I think people who are genuinely want to sell for top dollar and you're asking questions about their property are thrilled to share. Yeah. And the very few people who go, whoa, that's a FISBO. Yeah, agree. That's somebody who does just want the price. And it's a big red flag. Listen to it. Honestly, I, people, it's so funny as I train this, people will start asking a few of the questions. But why aren't you asking all the questions? Let's get through really finding out everything we need to know about this property before you get there so you, you go in prepared. And here's the, the next questions, you know. So it might be a series of questions like, um, Michael, uh, tell me about your house. Describe it to me. And, um, you know, tell me about your kitchen. It's done over, you know. And I've had people say, you know, it's a new kitchen. You know, what year was it done? Mm, 
1992. <laughs> yeah, I, that's, a, that's a very common thing. And I, and I tell people all the time, a 15 year old kitchen is as outdated as a 35 year old kitchen. They're the same. You know, what Zillow said, you got nine years and you're fully depreciated. So um, these are things, so when I don't just ask about the kitchen, I'm, so I'm gonna say, tell me what your kitchen's like. Tell me about your cabinets. Tell me about your countertops. What's on the floor? What kind of hardware? What kind of light fixtures? And when you ask those questions, they say, this must be important. So if I start to say, oak cabinets for micro countertops, pink tile floor, you get a very different impression as a real estate agent of, I've got brand new white cabinets, I've got marble countertops, I've got hardwood floors. You, you can see the difference, but they need to know that the hardware makes a difference. You see the old brass, uh, polished brass stuff? and brass fixtures, you know, they pick that stuff out. They love that. But they need to know those things are important. Go right through the house. Is there any wallpaper in the house? Oh, why do you ask? I just want to tell you that the number one reason homes don't sell, according to the National Staging Association, is wallpaper. Just tell it out there. Do not judge during this process. You know, just be able to be able to answer these questions. Um, have you painted any rooms lately? Now, are they in hip neutral colors? Because if they just put painted the dining room burgundy, their hallway stage, they're suffering from a 1990s hangover, you know that that's not fresh paint that's going to sell for top dollar. So you, you really get into the details. Tell me about your bathroom. You know, I want you to go outside and look at your house. By the way, if you drove by your house, would you want to make an appointment on it? Those kind of, you got to dig deep in all these areas and it pays off huge dividends later because you're starting to get them. Now here's the question that people are always afraid to ask and as you moved before, um, how much do you want to ask for your house? Now this, agents are always afraid to ask this question. What do you mean? I called you in for a price. Yeah, I know you're thinking something. What you say to me will not um, influence my decision at all. I just basically want to know how much I'm going to disappoint you. <laughs> right? So, and I used to say that all the time. And sometimes they were really on the money and sometimes they're not. But it's important, you know, dig. Do not let them get away with, I really don't know, that's why I called you. You're the expert. No, I know oh, you're thinking no. something. It's got a number in the back of their mind. And you need to know if they want 680, right? And you know your, your opinion value is at 550. When you walk in, you have to be able to say something like, good news, I can get you to 680, but we're building an addition in a two car garage. You, you gotta be able to say that. You gotta know where you're at. So those questions, you know, here's another one you gotta ask. Are you thinking of going for sale by owner? You gotta know because you need to come back with full defenses on what the repercussions of for selling by owner are. What is your proposition and why, what's your value? Why is, are they going to shortchange themselves? What's, what's going on in the market? What do they need to be aware of? You know, you got to be ready. Who else are you calling in? Don't you want to know if they're calling call a banker or century 21 who's offering free, you know, warranties or whatever it is. Ask those questions. The more you know going in, the more empowered you are when you get there and you're going to be much more successful. And, and, and I would imagine, and we'll get to the listing presentation portion of it, is that all this knowledge then customizes your experience when you sit with them because you're going to now go with, with their objections near the top of the list opposed to just going with your standard set of, of objection handling. It, it will make your experience more customizable, more appropriate for that particular buyer or, sell, or the particular seller. Think about it, the whole world is being customized. You know, all the predictive analytics, all the ads are being, if we don't learn to really personalize all of our services, understanding the clients, you know, that's where we're losing. And here's another thing, Michael. Um, I read oh, probably five or six years ago now, a really great Harvard Business Review article on the most successful salespeople. There's five types. I don't know if you know the five types, but let's kind of go through them because I want people to think, who am I and what am I like and what am I doing and how is it affecting my business? So the first um, 
this the five types, and this is the biggest category of real estate agents are in the relationship builders. You know, are you someone that really works hard on building trust, building bonds? You know, making sure that you are um, there for them, right? So that's the first kind of um, salesperson. The second one would be the hard worker. You know, that's the guy that gets in there first thing in the morning, works late at night, makes all the phone calls. You know that type. They're just driven. They'll make the you know all the expireds, the cold calls. That's one type. The hard, hard worker kills themselves. The third one is the lone wolf. Do it my way or the highway. I'm the cowboy. This is the way I do it. The fourth one is the reactive problem solver. You have an issue. I'm going to fix it. Actually, those are the people that are liked the most by the consumer. People love the reactive problem solver because, you know, I, any issues come up, they're finding me people. They have the resources. They're personally coming over and cleaning my kitchen up before the open house. You know, like they love those people. The fifth one is the challenger. And those are the people who aren't afraid to say what needs to be said. The challenger is somebody who um, really brings value, customizes their presentation, who um, is uh, not afraid to be controversial with things like price. Um, and I will tell you now, the most successful agents are the challengers. So the listing presentation that I've set up, I think I'm a natural challenger anyway. That's just my makeup. I was never afraid to be controversial. I've never been afraid to say what's on my mind. I can be diplomatic. I always like to think I am. I'm being pretty strong here. But, you know, in situations, mirror people, understand, how, you know, you got to slow yourself down for people who are quiet, who need, you know, those introverted types. I once had early in my career a seller say, Linda, I'm glad you're here, but every time you leave, I need to take a nap. And I learned a lot from that, you know? <laughs> so you've got to uh, be comfortable with people. But we've developed a challenge of present listing presentation, which kind of pushes people to think differently about it, build value in their house. And that's what we're all about. And that's been our success. So I have some... Uh, slides or pictures yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you to show. Yeah, yeah. So if you could pull up maybe the first yeah. one for me. What Michael's pulling up here right now is this is the lead photo in our listing presentation. Scarlett Johansson. I love that this woman's on Facebook going, this is what I really look like and this is what happens to me for Hollywood. But we use this photo going, you know, when you are trying to sell your property, today selling your house is like internet dating, and you gotta get your makeup on. Can you show me the next photo now? Yeah. Thanks, Michael. So um, the next one we have, I think, is this, um, here we go, um, Amy um, Adams. You know, you gotta get dressed up for the party. You got a lot of people coming over, and it's worth doing. And the next one, I think we have Cameron Diaz. Oh. Oh, we don't have that one. Okay. Oh, oh, oh there's, the, there's the naked guy again. Uh, oh, there's Cameron. There's Cameron. Oh, there's Cameron. There's Cameron. There's Cameron. Cameron Diaz with and without her makeup on. You know, we've got to get your makeup on in order to create the product for market that is going to get the most clicks, the most attention, because it makes all the difference. The buying public is shallow, right? Just like we all. Did we all feel the reaction when we saw those before and after with the celebrities? Yeah. You know, yeah. who's going to yeah. get more hits on Match.com? And it's the same thing when you're selling real estate. Here's a Porsche. It's got a $500 wax job. But the one on the right will sell for thousands of dollars more. Do we need to detail your home? And this is how we help people create a product for market. Does that make sense? It, it, it does. I mean, I just I just took in my old car and I got a new car and I and I detailed it two days before I turned it back in. Like like that's just what I. Of course, that's what I'm going to do. I I I could have detailed it a month before, but I detailed it two days before I got it because I knew it was going to impact my return rate. Right. It's like so. It's absolutely we do it with our lives all the time. We go out on dates. We we, right. we we have a party. I mean, people come over to our house party. Your house is always so clean. No, no, we knew you were coming. So the house is clean. But I think agents, sometimes they walk in and houses are full of personal effects, photos, crap piled up everywhere. You know, we 
things when you're on that first <laughs> when you're on that first like that's how people live right yep. here's yep. Dave expose this house people have stuff but you know on the phone you set expectations going i just want to let you know when i come over you don't need to clean for me i know how people really live but when it comes time to show it to buyers they have rules you know there's nothing only one thing on the surface one thing on your mantle one thing on your coffee table nothing in the windowsills i want the desk cleared i don't want to see any cords hanging out everywhere all those things are really important but you got to talk about that on the phone before you get to the house because that way it's a formula and you're not embarrassing them you're not talking about it. so having those discussions of how you strategize for success right on the phone let them know it's about fresh paint decluttering and that professional staging works because the buying public is shallow uh, yeah, I, absolutely. And, and and one of the things too as well is, and Dave, you're, I'm not like this and you're not like this and a lot of great agents are, are, are like this, but I see it so often. The right time to get a listing on the pro, uh, on the market is as soon as possible. That's the mindset for a lot of agents. And, and, and Dave, I know you will not expose a property under the Enviro Realty Team banner until it's ready to go on the market where a lot of agents go in and go, well, let's just get it on the market. I just need a listing. Let's get it on. And sometimes, or most of the time, you know, first impression, best foot forward. Hey, it's going to take you a week and a half to get the property ready anyway. Let me get the pre-marketing done. Let's hit the ground running. Let's go. Opposed to, it doesn't need to be on the market right away. If if your market is that, um, you know, fickle, right? It might not be the best time to be making a financial decision. So, so uh, Linda, how do you how do you like? You go in saying, hey, I know you want to put the market right away, but you're not ready yet. How do you broach that conversation? Unless they have done, you know, committed the cardinal sin of purchasing when they really need to sell first, <laughs> you know, and then we just bring in our resources and clean up to do the best we can. But almost everyone needs to paint their porch and, um, you know, get the flowers in place and do those kind of things. We do kitchen refreshes all the time. I didn't send you those photos, but we're painting kitchen cabinets and putting down new countertops all the time because a five to seven thousand dollar investment in our market in Boston can translate to thirty forty eighty thousand dollars more money and you know it's worth taking your time to do it we often um, you know will list a home and not put it on for a month or two when we've done complete makeovers you take the little old lady house and going this has great bones let's paint it up do a little bit in the kitchen and bath let's put in the professional furniture We've spent maybe thirty-five or forty thousand dollars, but we can put that on for one hundred and twenty more. It makes a big difference. absolutely. Um, so we're yeah. Uh, Jesse Peters just had a listing that he was telling me about that they went and got it all ready for for sale, and then they liked it too much, so they stayed. So 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 that I mean that happens too as well. But but too as well. Here's the thing too is you know, so, it's only once. <laughs> So, so here's the thing too as well, and it gets to the commission conversation because I think they're parallels. When someone understands that a $7,000 investment in their home results in getting $40,000 more, it's the same thing as having the conversation that's saying actually paying a good commission to market your property properly will result in X amount of dollars more on the table. I think the consumer that only sees Commission in one conversation, price a home, and don't realize that at the end of the day, the balance sheet that gets handed over to you by your lawyer or your land title office at the end of it, once all said and done, that's the balance sheet that matters. And investing in countertops and cabinets is the same mentality as investing in a professional real estate agent or realtor that's going to maximize their dollar value. So if you start to get pushback on cabinets, you might get the same pushback when they don't see the value of ROI. They don't see that. So... You know, who wouldn't take seven thousand dollars with a virtually guaranteed return of forty thousand dollars? I can't leave money on the table. I was hardwired to get top dollar, and people we built that reputation for people. And that when you start to do that, we built a reputation as the people who sold the nicest houses. They didn't start that way, um, but that's the product we put on. Buyers, I mean, sellers need to understand they're competing. And their pro it's not their home anymore. Once they, they have to mentally let go that this is their home, 
They might not like what we recommend they even do. They need to move on. If we can get a seller to get into another place and let us have it uh, um, empty, that's ideal, but not practical for a lot of families. But it, it, we do work with attorneys and estates to turn them over and maximize the profit. Um, we have contractors who will actually come in and get paid out of closing. There's a lot of ways you can work that once you've got your team in place to get that done. But let's go back to price. Um, you know, let's talk about how we try to get the sellers to wrap their head around what's the right price. And years ago, I developed a, a I think, a pretty good definition of the right price. I don't know how this resonates with the two of you. The right price is the price a buyer hesitates to pay, but feels like if they don't, someone else will. That's, it's that, I don't want to pay that, but if I don't, right? And understanding that pricing is on a bell curve. Unlike a lot of agents go in and say, you know, we have to put this on for 535, 247, whatever it might be. And I never did that. Pricing your house. I, I'm going to recommend a price of five four ninety nine. That's a great price. Recommend nine four ninety nine. But I won't tell you that I think your house is going to go between seventy five and five and a quarter. And you're thinking, why the hell would you put it on for four ninety nine if you think I might be able to get five and a quarter? Because I know your chances of getting five and a quarter are the same as getting four seventy five. It's the bell curve. And you can underprice a house if you don't allow the market to work. So what we've developed here, and I've been doing this for 20 years now, is we put every listing on on Wednesday in the MLS. Thursday, we do broker tour. Thursday night, we do a um, commuter open house. Saturday and Sunday, we are putting those uh, houses on tour for public tour for agents. And we review offers Tuesday at noon. Now. We have a red hot market here, but even we were doing that back in 2010, 11 and 12, pricing them so sharp that we were still getting multiple offers because no one was at asking price. Because if you put it on for a price that the buyers perceive to be a value, it makes sense because most agents, I mean, the mistake sellers make is they think if I ask for more, I'll get more. When in fact you get more if you put it on for the right price. I, I I agree. It's it's Makes it's sense. easier to overprice a house than underprice a house because the market won't let you underprice a house. Like you know, like a, a, eventually there's some price where the market won't let you underprice it. And the other thing too, as well, uh, uh you know, on that con on that conversation is if you're priced once again, it's it's the I better buy it before somebody else does mentality. That's what we try to go after. And if you've been on the market for four weeks, that's gone. Right, that 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 I better buy it before someone else expires over a certain amount of time, and then and then the other question is, yeah, and the other one is, well, let's start at five twenty five, waste our first two weeks of actually being new on the market, and then put it on for what we should have priced it all along, and that's a conversation and a mentality that over twenty four years I have all the time. Dave, just I mean. I, I'm sure that's just psych psychological. Let's try it, and then I'll actually put it on for what I know in my gut is the right price. The seller knows is the right price, but what if? How yeah. do you, Dave, how do you have that conversation? We have, well, we have a little graph in our listing presentation. It shows where the majority of the, of the people that are going to look at this property are coming in the first two weeks, and then after that, you're just going to get new people to the market who are not really ready to buy because they've only looked at two houses you know, unless you're in some crazy, crazy hot market. But even then, so we need to get it. So right here in the beginning, at this little curve here where all these people are showing up, we're 20 versus two, we want to get your property sold. So the, the key is the price. We, we, we have a lot of emphasis in our listing presentation on price it right in the beginning. That, that, that thing to come down in price, it's, that's a waste of your time. But, 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 but we see it all the time because you're going to have an agent that either doesn't want to have the conversation or are so desperate for a for sale sign that says, yeah. And, and, and there's agents that will then buy your listing by saying, like at the very beginning, Linda, yeah, he offered me $40,000 more. I'm going to go with that guy. And before you know it, you're 20 grand below what I had recommended because you're chasing the market down. You've lost, like right now, there's 20 people on the, on, in the market that want your home. 
how often do they revisit the price change anyway? To get them back in the front door, we all know as agents, is almost a monumental task. Once they've come in through and they've mentally written you off, it's, it's, it's impossible to get them back through the front door. It is. It is one of the most important skills for agents to develop is how to price. So years ago, I, I heard myself saying to someone who was begging me, can't I put it on for more money? The unit upstairs sold for more money. I'm going, the unit upstairs was far superior. It was all renovated. Yours is not. And then I heard myself say, listen, it's like your virginity. You're only new once. And that's how it goes, right? So, um, and that stuck with people and it's true. You cannot miss the mark on the market as you come out. You lose that new car smell. But, but you know what, it, 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 it's, you know, people want, people gravitate, I think therapist wise, once again, so, uh, socially to safety. And I think one of the things you said is very, very important. And, and, and it's, it's, what, it's my aha for the, for the episode is, you're as likely to get 525 as 475. Is that the gamble you want to take? Or do you want to take the safe bet, the burden hand, and go for 500? Uh, that, that, that just structuring it that way, saying, yeah, they're, they're equal likely to happen. So if, if 475 is unbearable for you, then you might not want to risk that. And, and, and that for sure is already my takeaway. That's the, that's the Lee Brown 110 sort of pricing game changer for me so far, Linda. But uh, continue with uh, anything more on pricing because Dave said it many times on the show. The skill set, there's a lot of skills. Uh, generate leads, convert leads, buyer representation, all sort of stuff. Dave has been very consistent since the day I met him. And we met over a listing presentation seminar that we or a presentation we gave at R4 is pricing is a skill that will make you successful. And if you do not have that skill, it's hard. And once again, I think it, where it's very hard to become razor sharp at, at pricing is if you're selling four homes a year. How can you possibly have your thumb on the market of what's happening right now? There's, right now, we're in a change of, of, of market. And we, we knew it. Our team knew it the second that the market changed. There's a lot of that haven't listed a home in three months that are oblivious that it's changed because the last time they sold a house, it was roaring. I think, I think one of the things, pricing is a skill set, but you've got to keep, that's a, that's a muscle you got to keep flexing constantly because it's, 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 it's razor thin sometimes. Well, I'll say it again. Not, not that you would, not that you would, but you can forget all the other skills there are. Every one of them. You don't need to listen. You don't need to do nothing. If you can price it right, you're... 80% of the way there. So I just want to add two things to this. Uh, the first is you can't price too low if you don't allow the market to work. You, you put it on for that price and you're going to take it th that night. So you have got, if you know you're pricing it in the middle, allow a time for review of offers. Allow all the buyers to get through there because you got to let the market work and push that price up if it's worth it. So that's I, 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 absolutely because as a buyer's agent, I've been in the scenario too where I've said to my client, "This is underpriced. Let's see if they'll take an offer tonight." Oh, oh. my goodness, they're looking at offers tonight. Once again, that listing agent hasn't sold oh, wow. homes for you know one every four months, and we've stolen properties from people. Um, so pricing helps you both ways to identify that and educating your buyer too as well because we'll gladly steal a property if you want to, but you're right. I mean, until, you, until everyone gets a chance to go through, how do, you, how, have you, how do you know you found the ideal buyer? Absolutely. Sorry, Linda, continue. We have that one-week process that has worked out really well for us. Um, and at 525, remember, if they, they really insist on going on high, you've got to caution them about the risk they're taking because when you start to languish on the market, as you said, you wind up with less money than you would have had you started at the right price. It's almost, you know, because now you're more negotiable when you come down. So understanding how to relay that and communicate that is just absolutely key. So that's where I'm at. Yeah. And, and, and where does motivation come into pricing too as well? I mean, a lot of times we say to clients, what's most important? Highest dollar value. And the real most important is I need to move in three weeks. Like, like pricing is all about where they are because that changes a whole lot too as well. I mean, you can't, it's amazing what perception of time is to, to reality. So I'm going to suggest that 15% of all listings 
are really not with motivated buyers. They're people who are trying. If they get money that's unrealistic, they'll sell. So we have to really be careful of that. Um, and with that 15%, if you ask those motivational questions like why are you moving on the phone you'll know whether you're dealing with someone real or not yeah agreed agreed um so now now i mean we've already i mean this is going to be a two episode or uh, linda because there's so much content here listing presentation because i think i think when it comes to actually having something that um uh is a value and dave so willingly gives his listing presentation away, trains people in his own marketplace. But I think a great listing presentation is one of those assets that is so, so important. And I don't know, actually don't know your mindset. I'm shocked by how many agents go, oh no, I just sit down and chat. I mean, we just, we just talk. It blows my mind. Um, where are you with your listing presentation? How do you go in? What materials do you go to? Do you continue the question asking when you're sitting belly to belly with them? Actually, we make sure answers to any questions we might not have gotten on the phone um, when you come in. I will tell you in our area, I don't know what it's like everywhere, but we disclose right on the phone, by the way, you haven't hired me yet. You know, I'm not your agent. Um, it's kind of like reading the Miranda rights because I'm going to ask more questions than most agents will. And I want to be able to sleep at night that they know they haven't hired me and they should be careful about what they want to tell me. This will tell you everything anyway, but you can feel better. Um, in terms of the listing presentation, I go into that and people make the mistake of walking around the house. Stop, sit down at the table and have a nice discussion with the sellers. This is where you're meeting. Do not start measuring and walking around. Sit and get to know each other. And you better be arriving with good data. What are the absorption rates? What are the, you know, your closing rates, your months of inventory, the sales trends. I think starting off um, positioning yourself as an expert who knows the data, what's going on. And um, lastly, on price, price against the actives, not the sold. That's how buyers look at price. They are going to look at what else is available in the market. But anyway, back to the table. We're going to bring data and then we will go through an actual formal listing presentation on the computer. You can do it two ways them or let them read it. It's self-evident. Our presentation is easy on the eyes. You can go around and measure while they go through it. Just I want them to have all the information and bring up all of the issues that they should be considering so they will make good decisions throughout the process. I'm there a couple of hours. Well, when I was, I'm not actively selling real estate now. Yeah, uh, we're, we're, we're about an hour and a half, two hours for our listing presentation when it's all said and done. Dave, are you around that same time frame? You're a little tighter or where are you at for time frame? No, when we're there, we, we actually do, most cases, it's a two-step. We do, we do it yeah. in the same kind of way that, that, that Linda's talking about, but it's a little bit different. But it's a two-step. And the second time, we're, first time we're there to gather information as much as we can, questions, motivations, all the stuff she's talking about. And the second time is, I'm here to educate the seller. All right, about the process and so forth and so on. Prove my competency and my value and make myself, show you how different I am. And from there, but it's about an hour and a half. Yeah, and we do, and we do, we do two step two as well. I think a lot of the phone call that Linda does, we do in person, and it's, you know, that's just the way we've always done a two stepper. But the fact that I can go in, already have built a relationship with somebody the second time I go, and you've never, you know, or you've never spent time on the phone asking all these questions. How, I don't know how you can walk in blind without asking questions, just go in and think that you're going to build a relationship without having context. It just, it's, it's can't, I don't think it can be done. Or, or if you do go against me, I'll, I'll destroy you in a listing presentation. Yeah, I you know what? You know what? If you don't, if, if you ever have a seller go, Look, you don't need to ask me any of these questions. I talked to your friend. Your friend told me I got to list my house with you. So why don't you get over here and get the paperwork signed? It's the kiss of death for you as a real estate agent if you do that. You need to make sure that they have everything that you have to say to them and you have everything that you need to know. Because the worst list, I, it's never failed us yet. We've done it a couple of times, Vanessa and I. And we walk out of the thing and go, oh, man, this is going to be a nightmare. I can tell. They just signed. It was done. We didn't talk to them about nothing, and we don't. I don't even know what's going on here. And sure enough, and we'll never ever ever do it again. And any agent that does it is like out of your mind. So it, it's a it's a big lengthy process, but you know it, it pays off for your clients. Forget you, your clients benefit more. And go back to what Linda said in the beginning. There's so many agents out there 
call, costing the public so much money, buyers and sellers, because they're a bunch of incompetent idiots and they're doing things and the public doesn't even know it. They don't even know what's going on. But they, oh, I like you. You're, I mean, he's a relationship type uh, agent. I really like that guy. He's cool. And they, and and in the end, it doesn't work out for anybody. But they sell the house, and everybody gets paid, and away they go. And it's well, and and, and it goes back to Dave. What Linda said at, near the beginning of the show. One of the reasons why she started asking all these questions were for selfish reasons because she wanted the transaction go smoother in this industry more than anywhere else that i can think of there is such value in mutual benefit like, like there is so much value in mutual benefit there isn't when someone just buying a pizza from somebody there's not that much mutual benefit for for the pizzeria oh, it's be a good pizza. The benefit. when the transaction goes smoother for linda it goes smoother for the seller it's better for the seller and the result is better. It becomes repeat and referral business. It becomes someone out there becoming your, 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 your social media word of mouth army that you're trying to create. Let's, let's understand that when the transaction is smooth, when there is um, expectations set in place, we've had clients buy from us seven, eight times. They sit down and they get the whole two and a half, two hour speech because now this new form is different. Now we're new doing 360 virtual tours, spherical. Now we're doing more video. Here's what you have to know. The pricing's changed. Like they have to sit through it because it's in that lack. You're better off spending an hour then headache free, enjoying time, having a cup of coffee with your client face to face than dealing with the headache, the four hours of, of, of it being abrasive a month down the road. And friends it's, it's and insane. relatives. Friends and relatives, especially. Thanksgiving um, dinner, you know how that works. <laughs> Crazy people, right? So, 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 Linda, I mean, that has, that's the trick of all of it. I mean, it's, it's, it's in this, it's, it's in the understanding, the therapist understanding what the problem is before you could ever, ever suggest a solution. I mean, that's, it's, it's insane. It's diagnose. Diagnose. You got to diagnose. Every, the reason sellers call you is they have a problem. They have to sell. They want top dollar. And you can't solve it unless you know what's going on. It's as simple as that, really. And so, so when you're helping people through this and helping people understand the psychology of, 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 of listing, Linda, what, what are those? I mean, you must see the eyes light up for someone that hasn't been doing it this way. What are those two little, three little points that people are like, oh, that's going to change the game. That's, that's, that's where, where it is. I mean, we probably touched on a lot of them already. That if... Here's what's amazing is I present this all the time. It's kind of my uh, number one talk I give. People love it and then they're afraid to implement it. They get awkward about asking the questions. They ask a few of them, not all of them. And it doesn't work unless you go through the entire process. So if I can um, compel people to learn from the mistakes I've seen made is go in full force you know, the full Monty, ask all the questions. You'll never regret it. It just sets the process up. But there's a million other pieces of the listing presentation system to go into, but that's a good start. Well, you know what? Let's, let's if you want, let's come back and do listing presentation because I would love to have that conversation with you and Dave too as well. Uh, it's been a while since we've, we've tackled that, that, that conversation. But on that note, uh, Linda, uh, I think what, one of the reasons why people don't implement is fear. I think a lot, of, a lot of it has to do with fear. So let me ask you the fear question. What could possibly go wrong? What can happen to an agent if they, if they tell the truth, if they ask the questions, if they provide value, if they don't mislead, if they don't try to please? What, what, is, what is the consequence uh, business okay, personally when, when, you, when you do it that way? Because it must be horrible for people not to do it. <laughs> So I can tell you that it might not, you know, you should be yourself and it might not be for everyone. I just found it to be, you know, not a magic bullet, but a way that worked with everybody. Very little resistance. I'm not saying there won't be any resistance, but very little resistance. People genuinely lap it up, but people are afraid to do things differently. They do things the way everyone else has been doing them for years. And we should start with that. I tell. Next time we do a piece together, we're gonna to start with a candid camera clip. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and and the thing too is about is when you do meet resistance, 
isn't that where you're actually starting to find out what the real issues are? I mean, like, it's like, go back to that therapist. When you do meet resistance, isn't that a good thing? Aren't you starting to uncover something that you might actually want to know? Um, they're not as qualified. A seller that doesn't want to sell is not a listing. Like all these things that we, we should be finding out is in that resistance. And, and Dave, I, I, we, we talk about it all the time. I mean, telling someone the truth, they need your service. Being a professional doesn't have bad consequences. At worst, at worst, they'll disagree with you and have the utmost respect that you were willing to tell them the truth. At worst, they'll disagree with you and respect you for, for, for telling them what you believe is the truth. You have an absolute obligation to ask questions. You do. You just have an absolute. It's, it's, it's pure. If you don't ask questions, you don't belong in the business. Well, what, what, once again, here it goes back to the same thing we've been preaching. All the, all the questions Linda's talked about, all the things we've ever said, Dave, you're asking questions to find out the roadmap that's best for your seller or your buyer. I can't help you if I don't know what's going on here. And it's almost like one of the things you could sit down at the table and go, okay, why am I here? What's going on? Yeah, that's right. Because and you're asking shut questions. Up, shut up. And don't say another word and just listen and make notes. That's all you got to do. And when you and don't tell ask you. questions. When you don't ask questions, it's because you already know what's best because you are looking out for what's best for you and you want to get back, you want to get out, you want to get it signed, you want the for sale sign in there because you think transactionally that that's best for you. And, and, and you know what your answers are. You could not tell me that you, you are, are absolutely 100% in the best interest of your client if you aren't approaching it like Linda says, that you aren't doing it this way. Absolutely. Because – you're right. It's we've left those listings before. We're like, this is going to be a headache. We cut a corner. Here we go. And sure enough, you know, Jordan, Trish, and I are staring at each other in a, in a meeting three months later. Going, what were we thinking? Like, it's just that's the way it's going to go. And we're upset. And the client's not happy. No one's going to win when you don't do it right. No one's going to win when you don't do it. And right. you're not building a business. Well I'm hoping that people are finding comfort that the challengers are the most successful sales agents. And here's the question to end up with. I mean with everything. Anybody you meet, anytime you're interviewing, anyone in any situation should be, are there any other questions I should ask? Yeah. That's because that elicits things that aren't standard. And so that's a great way to end up, I think. Yeah, and it, and it goes to the Sean Moore ice cream question that – that, that we use in our presentation, like basically saying like, what are your expectations to create a super happy client at the end of it? And it's one of those scripts, <laughs> lines, like the Lee Brown that has fundamentally changed it. So uh, there, I've got three in my listing presentation now. I've got Lee Brown's one to 10. I've got Sean Moore's ice cream and I've got Linda O's. You're as likely to get 525 as you are 475. And that's, that's a game changer for me. Um, Linda, would you come back? We'll do part two. We'll get into the listing presentations. We'll get in that skill. It's something that Dave and I are super passionate about. You're a great third person to have that conversation with. Uh, we would love to do that uh, probably in the new year sometime if, 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 if that would work for you. It would be great. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Um, before we get to Linda's final little sign off and, 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 and telling us how we, we get a hold of her and how we move from a brokerage in Boston and join Leading Edge, um, how do we, uh, I'm allowed to say that? I'm allowed to say that, right? I'm allowed to say it. Dave, your takeaways for the show. I, I, she's saying a lot of the same things that I put into my listing presentation. I love the, I really love the, the emphasis on the fact that you should ask questions. You know, look, I, that, I already kind of know that, but that's the message we need to deliver to all the agents watching this, people that aren't doing it and don't be afraid to follow the script and do something a little bit different um, that, that Linda's kind of thrown out here for us, but ask questions and treat yourself like a professional and you're going to have much more success for your clients. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, Linda, how do people get a hold of you? Uh, get a hold of now. You're the, you're the CEO of Remax Leading Edge. You're in the, uh, in the New England, Boston marketplace. How do people get a hold of you? Uh, send you an email, ask you questions, say thank you uh, to you out there in New England. Uh um, always welcome a call. Um, my cell phone is 781-820-2560. Email uh, Linda O 
at leadingedgeagents.com. Um, you just call Remax Leading Edge. They'll patch you through to Linda O and the Redhead. And uh, I'm very uh, honored to be here with you today. Well, Linda, you're amazing. Uh, like I said, uh, like I said, I. I, I, I Oh, I got some feedback there. Oh, I've been following you around. Here, 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 listen to you in Germany. You're amazing. Thank you so much. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Linda, don't go uh, away. What was that, Dave? No, I was telling Linda, don't go away. I want to talk to her off. off. Yeah, yeah. Linda, you got to stay on afterwards because I know there's a question coming from Dave, and I already know what it is. Um, so, everyone, thank you very much. Next week, we're going to come to you from Genuine Hustle down at Tacoma, Washington, just outside Seattle. I'll be at the Genuine Hustle Conference. We're going to be tackling the conversation. The whole conference is about community. We're going to have some great guests for you. Don't know exact time, Wednesday evening or Wednesday afternoon. We'll get it on, but we'll send out a bomb bomb. If you're not subscribed to our bomb bomb newsletter, go to mobileagenttv.com on the right-hand side. You can sign up. We'll send you out an email before the show starts. And we've moved the live uh, uh, broadcasting live, Facebook live, YouTube live show from November 18th to December 2nd, waiting for my new equipment to show up. Happy birthday, Kevin Tangon and Bruce Johnson as Melanie Gallia. Remax Fort Memory wants to stand every show. Tell five other Remax agents about Mobile Agent TV. It allows us to eat up an hour and 12 minutes of people's time like Linda O oh, is gracious to give us their time, which is amazing. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you, everyone, for watching. We'll see you next week.